Valentino giving me shit. were technically similar. The murders of Tupac and Biggie were technically similar. Both late night gang style drive by shootings that were, in my opinion, both carried out by active gang members, but otherwise wildly different in how they were handled. While Tupac's alleged killers went back home and bragged about it to half of Compton, the people behind Biggie's murder kept things a lot closer to the vest. With both murders, some people have speculated that they were professional hits, which I think is baseless. But the Biggie murder's prime suspect from an investigation conducted 15 years ago was actually pretty close to being a professional hitman, just a gang version of it. This is everything we know about the shadowy figure known as Wardell Poochie Faust. Poochie was born in Kentucky in 1960 and moved to Compton in 1972. Three years later, as a 14-year-old, he allegedly committed a drive-by shooting on the house of another kid. This kid here was supposedly his target, while Poochie's own stepfather drove the car. No one was injured in the shooting, but Poochie's stepdad was eventually convicted for the crime. In the late 80s, Poochie allegedly killed an Elm Street Piru named O.G. Stoney, walking up to him on the street in broad daylight and shooting him in the head in front of multiple witnesses. In 1991, Poochie was a suspect in a deadly home invasion robbery that he allegedly committed with his own stepbrother that had killed one man, uh, who they'd had run-ins with in the past apparently, who was shot multiple times after being tied up, and they wounded his girlfriend with a gunshot to the head. Uh, they left her for dead, basically. Four children were in the house at the time. Poochie was older than most of the other Pyrus around death row records, and he seemed to be focused on his business, like a professional. He was a bit of a loner and reportedly didn't like being around death row, really didn't like the rappers that much, and didn't like partying with the other Pyrus around the label. As a result, very few photos of him exist. And in the ones that do exist, he was often wearing sunglasses or shielding his face. About a year and a half before Biggie's murder, a 33-year-old named William Ratcliffe Hole, AKA Rat, was gunned down on the evening of October 26, 1995, while standing with a group of men on Central Avenue in Compton. According to an informant statement in 1997, Rat had previously had violent run-ins with Suge Knight. Rat's bounty hunters gang were rivals of Suge's mob Pyrus, and Rat had repeatedly pressured Suge for a record deal with either Death Row or Interscope. The first altercation happened when Rat and 10 other bounty hunters cornered Suge in a bathroom during a music video shoot, a situation the informant himself claims he got Suge out of and a second incident where their two crews got into a fight in the valet area of the Marriott Hotel next to LAX. Suge allegedly told people Rat's days were numbered. Enter the Hit Squad, a group of enforcers for death row who, according to the informant, consisted of some of the most feared gang members around the label. The Hit Squad's members allegedly included Poochie and a man named George, who may have been a good friend of Poochie's named George Williams. George and Poochie were probably the most feared guys around Suge Knight. And according to the informant, George was allegedly the squad's leader at the time of Rat's murder. But the informant claimed George was in jail at the time. So the responsibility for taking care of Rat fell on Poochie. Claimed that inside the party, a girl hanging close to Big had challenged the witness and said, what are you looking at? But outside in the parking garage, when everyone was leaving, that same girl suddenly approached him, acting nicely this time, and wanted to know which vehicle Biggie was in. She disappeared after getting the answer. So was Poochie the shooter? He's my leading candidate. Compton gang detective Bobby Ladd had run-ins with him and said he was certainly capable of it, as were several of the other alleged killers around death row at the time. I can tell you, that none of the Compton gang detectives or Pyrus around death row suspected it was done by cops and a mortgage broker from Virginia. 
Following the shooting of Tupac in Las Vegas in 1996, if you wanted to know who was behind it, all you had to look at was who his associates went after for revenge. And that week, the Bloods associated with Death Row Records declared war on the Southside Compton Crips. If there was ever any doubt over who was responsible for Tupac's murder, this bloody street war should have immediately settled the debate. On the night of Tupac's shooting in Las Vegas, the Bloods who are part of his entourage and who are held at the scene by Las Vegas police refuse to cooperate. They have their own justice in mind. According to a search warrant filed by Compton gang detective Tim Brennan, while still in Las Vegas, a person referred to as Trey, who was likely Trayvon Lane, who was there in Vegas with Tupac when he was shot, and whose beef with Southside Crip Orlando Anderson was the reason for the fight at the MGM that night, tells the Pyrus that the shooter was the same person they jumped at the MGM, and that person was Keefe D's nephew, who would be Orlando Anderson. The Pyrus decide right there to retaliate against the Southside Crips, saying it's on as soon as they get back to Compton. Two days later, on September 9th, Some of the alleged bloods associated with Death Row Records meet at Looters Park in Compton, the park associated with the Looters Park Pyrus and the Mob Pyru, both allegedly aligned with Death Row Records. Some of them discuss going after Southside's OGs in general, basically planning retaliation against Southside leadership, even against individuals who weren't there when Tupac was shot. And they begin planning drive-by shootings in Southside's neighborhood. We, the homies, they had everybody had a meeting, said, got down together, and well, we know who did it. We know Southside did it. Now, retaliation is Southside. We decided, it, I mean, basically, his own. They just killed Tupac. That same afternoon, this Compton gang war begins when one of the alleged Southside Crip shot callers, Darnell Brim, is shot and wounded. According to a police interview with Brim nine months later, he claims he was shot five times in the back at a 99 cent store. And he confirms that it was because of what happened in Las Vegas. Tragically, an innocent 10 year old girl is also hit when Brim is shot and was listed in a report at the time as being in critical condition. Ironically, Brim wasn't even in Vegas when Tupac was shot, but street rumors may have erroneously placed him there. In fact, to this day, it seems like Brim is still getting unfairly associated with Tupac's murder, as he was when he was sentenced to a decade in prison on drug charges just a few years ago. This is all part of an apparent pattern with the Southside Crips, at least according to Brim. His Southside set, referred to as the Glencoe Crew, and Keefe D's Southside set, who were the Burris Crew, are often at odds with each other and Brim blames the other set for starting problems that his crew then has to deal with. He even says in his interview back then that he's not even friends with Keefe and that Keefe likes to talk a lot. (laughs) And apparently the feeling was mutual because he says Keefe told him, you know what's going on, you don't like us, and we don't like you. Just keep it like that. So from the Glencoe crew's perspective, the Burris crew starts problems and then leaves Glencoe to deal with it and Tupac's murder is their biggest problem yet. But all of Southside knows this is coming, so they prepare and stick to their neighborhood. It ain't like we didn't know what street they was on, but those streets was empty. They wasn't stupid. They, they, I mean, if they knew it was on and, and there's going to be retaliation, let's not hang out like this, or let's hang further back in the cut. You know what I'm saying? Nine times out of ten, when you're in the car driving and you're looking for something, you ain't driving like that. Because everybody knows if you're driving like that and the window's down, they're going to start shooting at you before you start shooting at them. Everybody in the neighborhood know that. So riding around looking for something, you don't see it, let's roll. An alleged delivery of weapons arrives at one of the Southsiders' houses the following day. That same day, the brother of a former Death Row Records bodyguard is shot in a drive-by shooting. And a Looters Park Pyru and a second man are shot in a Looters Park neighborhood. The suspects are believed to be Southsiders. 
So now the Crips are taking the fight back into blood territory. The following morning, September 11th, a man named Bobby Finch is killed in front of his home in a drive-by shooting. Finch had allegedly been involved in the drug game, but was unaffiliated with the Crips and had worked as a bodyguard in clubs and supposedly for an actress on the show Martin. But he reportedly had a nice car and the Crips rivals were looking for OGs. An informant tells Compton PD the mob killed Finch, meaning the mob Piru associated with Death Row Records allegedly killed him. It's believed that Bobby Finch was an innocent victim of mistaken identity and that alleged Southside associate Corey Edwards, who was in Vegas the night of Tupac's murder, and who was reportedly connected to an address next door to Finch, was the real target. Corey Edwards would tell detectives in 1997 that after Tupac's murder, he'd warned Finch and his brother that the mob Piru would be rolling through their neighborhood. Two days later, on September 13th, Tupac dies in the hospital in Las Vegas from wounds he suffered in the shooting. That day, two more Pyrus are killed until Biggie comes to town a few months later. Tupac's murder. While it's true that an informant speculated that Bonds may have been involved in Tupac's murder, because they saw Bonds in a white Cadillac in Compton two days after Tupac was shot. Bonds. Now I've pieced together multiple pieces of evidence scattered throughout the case files, um, of which there are thousands of documents and probably a hundred plus hours of witness interviews, and I think I've figured out the source of these claims. And it starts with a simple question. Was Biggie under police surveillance in Los Angeles in the days leading up to his murder? And the answer may surprise you, because the answer is yes. Now, Biggie had multiple run-ins with the law in the years prior to his death. Uh, he dealt drugs and done some petty crimes uh, in his earlier years, which he then rapped about. More recently, in July of 1996, a cop responding to his home in New Jersey over a report about a, a car parked illegally in a red zone turned into a, a huge police raid after that cop smelled marijuana smoke coming from the home. That raid uncovered drugs and weapons, I mean, drugs being marijuana. There were other investigations. I don't want to rehash all of it. It's been well covered in the media over the years, and I, and I don't want to seem like I'm beating up on Biggie. But for our purposes, the point is that he was on law enforcement's radar at the time of his death. So, who was in L.A. watching Biggie? Our first clue comes from his own entourage, uh, and an incident that happened outside the Soul Train Music Awards at L.A.'s Shrine Auditorium the night before Biggie was murdered. Biggie and Puffy and some of their entourage are inside the award show where Biggie is presenting an award. Uh, outside, some members of their security detail and their drivers are waiting for them to come back out. Uh, they reportedly were inside the venue for about 90 minutes. During this time, a local cop suddenly appears and warns bad boy security standing outside with their vehicles that there are cops across the street who have them under surveillance. Now, when I first came across this, I thought, that seems kind of sketchy. Why would one cop rat out other cops and potentially blow their operation? It just, it sounded kind of shady to me. But then I got the other side of the story, and it took some after the shooting happened to get this first tip. And then buried in the chrono for the RHD detectives who eventually took over Biggie's case a few weeks later, uh, and they, these detectives included Russell Poole, the uh, famous or infamous detective in this case, depending on your point of view. And this entry was on April 17th, 1997, so about five weeks after Biggie's murder. And here's where we learn exactly what happened outside the Shrine Auditorium during the Soul Train Music Awards. An LAPD gang detective is on duty in the South Bureau Division on the night of the award show when he gets a page from a sergeant who is on duty working overtime at the award show. This sergeant at the award show has been contacted there by an NYPD detective and an IRS agent who are working a task force outside the Shrine Auditorium. 
It turns out the IRS agent was a special agent with the Department of the Treasury, and the NYPD detective was named Detective Oldham, and he worked with their major case squad. So this LAPD gang detective gets this tip from the sergeant at the award show, and he decides he's going to go down there himself to the shrine to locate these two detectives from New York and find out what's going on. Because apparently the LAPD isn't aware that there's an operation happening, or at least this guy, this detective, hasn't been made aware of it. So this LAPD gang detective finds the detectives from New York outside the award show, and he sees that they're taking surveillance photos. And when he looks to see who they're photographing, he sees bad boy security team waiting around their vehicles outside the venue. And he notices that some of them have bulges in their jackets, indicating that they may be armed. And then he recognizes one of them. He recognizes Inglewood police officer Reggie Blaylock. And Blaylock would end up being a witness to Biggie's murder the following night. He was driving the third SUV with bad boy's head of security, Paul Offord, that was behind Biggie's Suburban when the shooting happened. They're the ones who chased after the shooter but lost him. So this gang detective spots Blaylock standing outside the Shrine Auditorium, recognizes him as an officer with the Inglewood Police Department. And what this detective does next inadvertently changes music history. Following Biggie's murder in 1997, numerous jailhouse informants came forward with claims about who had committed the crime. And the one that would get the most attention was from an inmate named Michael Robinson, who, even though he was a schizophrenic, convicted murderer, would become the foundation of the Detective Russell Poole theory that an LAPD officer and his friend had murdered Biggie. But Michael Robinson's statement, which you will hear in this episode for yourself, has been wildly misrepresented by Russell Poole and others over the years. Even after we put segments of this interview into the Murder Rap documentary six years ago, Poole's friends and collaborators have continued to pretend that this recording doesn't even exist. And when you hear it, you'll know exactly why. At the time that Michael Robinson gave this statement, where he allegedly named Biggie's killer, he was in the L.A. County Jail in Castaic with another man named Waymond Anderson. Anderson had been a singer in the 80s whose cover of My Girl for Capitol Records had been a minor hit. But then a few years later, Anderson was convicted of a 1993 arson murder for a fire in a drug den behind this apartment building near USC's campus that killed a person. Anderson got life in prison for it. And he's come forward himself with some wild tales over the years about the murders of both Tupac and Biggie, even though he'd been in jail for years by the time of the murders. Anderson would claim that Michael Robinson got some of his information from him while they were housed together in the same unit in jail. The statement given by Michael Robinson in 1997 would form the foundation for Russell Poole's entire theory that LAPD officer David Mack had conspired with a friend named Amir Muhammad to kill Biggie. Amir Muhammad was a mortgage broker living in the San Diego area at the time. He had been college friends with David Mack. When David Mack went to jail for a bank robbery, Amir Muhammad visited him in jail. And this visit, combined with what Michael Robinson would say in his interview, would make Amir Muhammad Russell Poole's prime suspect for the next two decades. Without Michael Robinson, Poole's theory never exists. In April of 1997, just a few weeks after Biggie's murder, Waymond Anderson had come forward with a claim that Suge Knight had approached him in jail about the Biggie murder, a claim that was later disproven by the fact that he and Suge were never together at the inmate reception center in L.A. like he'd claimed. Three months later, on July 10th, 1997, Michael Robinson then stepped forward and took his shot. Michael Robinson was interviewed by RHD Detective Ball and an L.A. Sheriff Sergeant named Valdemar. And this interview is, frankly, bananas. July 10, 1997, the time is approximately 14, 10 hours. 
My name is Detective Ted Ball, B-A-L-L. My number is 17549 from Robbery Homicide Division. This is a tape recorded interview with Michael Robinson. Is it R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N, Michael? Yes. And your date of birth? 112457. 112457. Your booking number? Uh, 591. Excuse me, is it, could it be 15109? Yes, that's... 019. 019. Okay, and that's what's on your wrist? Yeah. Okay, also in attendance at this interview is a uh, LASO Sergeant, <coughs> excuse me, Richard Valdemar. In 2002, a book about Russell Poole's theory came out called Labyrinth, followed a couple years ago by a follow-up book called Dead Wrong. And that second book claims that Sergeant Valdemar, who was one of Robinson's handlers as an informant and who was in this interview with the RHD detective, was actually asked to leave the room as soon as he introduced Detective Ball to Robinson. And that because Valdemar was asked to leave, it's implied that we couldn't be certain that the detective's account of what Robinson said was accurate. But as you just heard in the first clip, the detective introduces Valdemar on tape at the beginning of the interview, and the recording never shows him asking Valdemar to leave. And there is a third voice in the room chiming in throughout this interview. And again, we don't have to take the detective's word about what Robinson said, because it was taped. Is this the tape that Russell Poole didn't want us to hear because he was the one that misrepresented what was said on it? Five and a half minutes into this interview, we get to why we're here. This is the Russell Poole Theories big moment. Michael Robinson is going to tell us firmly and without a doubt the name of Biggie's killer. And that person is... Well, <laughs> he can't actually remember. In fact, the detective has to remind him of the name of his own suspect. <laughs> Tell me what you know about the Biggie case. Um, the dude name is, uh, uh, Abraham, I guess, I guess, I uh, said his name is, uh, so, um, his Arab name. Um, okay, who's the dude, who are you talking about? Uh, it's not, uh, I'm telling you his name, it, it, yes, I can't, you know, I'll read right, so Okay, so this is the man. man you're describing here. Yes. Is the killer. Yes. Okay. You know him as Abraham? Abraham, or I told you the name yesterday, uh, the name of Arab, 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 Arab name. Okay, you told me yesterday the name of Amir. Amir. Amir? Amir. Yeah. Amir or Amir. It's an Arab name. Ashmir yeah. or, Amir. or Amir. Yeah. Wow. A man was accused of murder over this? A man's life was nearly ruined over that? This has to be one of the shakiest witness IDs in the history of law enforcement. It's clear to me that Poole's star witness, who started this whole thing, clearly doesn't really know the guy's name. The detective has to tell him, is this tape real? Are these actors? Is this hour-long interview where he talks about not only this murder, but a whole totally unrelated, old unsolved murder of a police officer from years earlier? Can you tell me if this hour-long interview with their star witness is fake? Because they act like this tape doesn't even exist. According to the Dead Wrong book, Michael Robinson stated later, under oath, that the only name he gave Detective Ball in this interview was Amir. Well, that's a lie. You just heard it for yourself. So Michael Robinson lied about this under oath. So let's see what else he says. Robinson claims to have known Biggie's killer for years. How long would you say you have known this man? About five years, ten years, maybe longer, twelve. He's then asked to describe this Abraham, Ashmere, or Amir person. Hey, did you know this man? Yes. Have you ever seen him? Yes. What's he described as? Oh, about six one, maybe six two. Male, black, white, or black. How much does he weigh? So about two twenty two thirty. Well, Russell Poole's Amir Muhammad was 5'11 and 180 pounds, so the description doesn't match at all. Robinson is describing a big guy, but Amir Muhammad is medium-sized. The age he gives for this guy is also completely off. About how old is he? 
I'll say about 29, 30. Amir Muhammad would have been 37 at the time of this interview, only two years younger than Michael Robinson. He wasn't 29 or 30. Robinson then claims that Amir lives near Greenleaf and Johnson in Compton. Do you know where he lives? Yeah, well, I don't know exactly where he lives. I know the houses out there. He'd be over there off of Greenleaf and off of Johnson. Well, Greenleaf and Johnson don't intersect. They run parallel. But Johnson Street doesn't go very far, so we can see that Robinson is describing the area near Southside Crips neighborhood in Compton, just on the western edge of it. These streets to the east, Burris, Mayo, these are Southside Crip streets. That's their park, South Park. And a few minutes later, Robinson claims that the guy's birth name, before he converted to Islam, was either Kenny or Kiki. Do you know what they used to call him when he was Southside? Might be Kenny or Kiki, Kiki or something. Kiki or something like that. I don't know the guy. Kiki, Kiki, yeah, Kiki or something like that. First, he couldn't remember the guy's Muslim name, and now he can't remember the guy's birth name. Also, did you notice that the detective referred to this individual as a Southsider, meaning Southside Crip, and Robinson didn't correct him? When he was a Southsider, might be Kim. Well, a few minutes earlier, Robinson had confirmed that the guy he's talking about was a Southside Crip. So, at one point, he was associated with either the Southsiders. Southsiders. Yeah. Now, Wayman Anderson would claim later that when Robinson first approached him in jail, that Robinson had overheard Anderson talking about a man named Keefy D. And Keefy D was a shot caller for the Southside Crips. So the same neighborhood that Robinson's trying to say this guy lives in. And now Robinson is telling police that he thinks the shooter's non-Muslim name is either Kenny or Kiki. That sounds a lot like Keefy. Keefy's name was associated with the Biggie case from the beginning because the Southside Crips were one of the groups rumored to have been responsible. And because Keefy was at the party the night Biggie was killed and had talked to him at his table. And these rumors about the Southside Crips are all over the streets when Robinson gives this statement. So Robinson is now throwing in elements of a completely different theory into this statement by making this a mere character, a Southside Crip, and then confusing him with Keefy. And this right here really shows you how complicated and nuanced this case is, and how if you don't know the backgrounds of the major players, you can take a few loose details from the case files and make a really big mess of things. Regardless, whoever the shooter is, Robinson's saying he knows this guy. He's telling you that Biggie's killer is a Compton street gangster who came up in the hood. He's from Compton. That is not Amir Muhammad, who grew up in Virginia and went to college in Oregon and was married and living in the San Diego area and working as a mortgage broker. But let's keep going. So why does Michael Robinson keep struggling to get the information right about this guy that he's supposedly known for years? I think it's because he's just repeating rumors and he's repeating nonsense that Wayman Anderson has told him. And why is he struggling to remember this information? Didn't he at least like run back to his cell and write it down so he'd remember it? Well, there's a good reason why he didn't. I don't know why I read Mike, so I can try to remember everything was what he said. I don't remember everything exactly because I don't read Mike. Robinson is illiterate, so he can't write it down. And I also think that Robinson slipped up here. I think he's also admitting that this statement he's making isn't based on things that he's experienced himself firsthand. I try to remember everything was being said, so I don't remember everything exactly because I don't read right. He's admitting that because he can't read or write, this is stuff that he's had to memorize from someone else. And that's why he's having trouble. Now that I think of it, didn't we hear him use the same excuse before? That he can't remember something important because he can't read and write. When did he say that? Oh yeah. Uh, Abraham, I can't can't, uh, say his name. It's uh, it's, uh, it's his Arab name. Um, Okay, who's the dude? Who are you talking about? uh, He's not, uh, I'm telling you his name. He did yesterday. I can't, you know, I don't read and write so You see what I see, right? Remember, Robinson has been asked twice now 
if he knew this guy. And both times, he indicated yes. How long would you say you have known this man? About five years, ten years, maybe longer, twelve. And did you know this man? Yes. So then why would he need to write down the guy's name to remember it? Michael Robinson never knew a killer named Amir. He was just repeating another random name that was floating around out there. And that's why he couldn't remember the name at the top of the interview. It's not something he'd lived, it's because he couldn't write it down when he heard it. Now the detective quizzes Robinson on the details of the murder to see if he knows the basics of what happened. And Robinson fails miserably. I was speaking killed. Uh, I heard the slightest walk by, shot him in his truck by, uh, five or six times through the door of the truck or something. How was he killed? He started to shot, they went by, shot by with a machine gun or something. Shot? Shot. What caliber of gun? Well, I heard a machine gun. It would have been a Woody or a Tech 9, I don't know. And so he was shot in his own machine gun. How did the guy get away? Did you ever hear anything about that? Then he ran around the corner and got in a, a, a limo or a truck or something, drove off him. Let me ask you this, do you know where Biggie was killed? No. I said, I don't read, no, I don't read, no, that type of stuff. No. Okay. So he thinks Biggie was killed by someone on foot, which is wrong. It was a semi-automatic handgun. He claims the guy got away by running around the corner and hopping into a limo or a truck. And he has no idea where Biggie was even killed other than that it was somewhere in Los Angeles. It's possible that in July of 1997, when this interview took place, that Michael Robinson knew less about Biggie's murder than just about anybody in the United States. So this is the guy who cracks the case open for Russell Poole? This guy? And Robinson wasn't the only jailhouse informant coming forward with bad information in the weeks and months following Biggie's murder. According to Kelly Cooper, an LAPD detective who originally worked the case for Wilshire Division, tons of inmates were coming forward with bogus information. We were getting phone calls for all kinds of inmates who had all the answers to everything. They witnessed all the days in prison. They knew everything. I don't care if the informants, the inmates or whatever, they got access to the media. And a big case like this, everybody's watching this. So now you got to run over there and interview this enemy who just got the information from the media. So you, you run in circles. But once you realize what he said is, is, is garbage, it's garbage. Just let it go. You don't pursue garbage. You're wasting your time. Now let's rewind and get back to this limo that Robinson claims the shooter escaped in. In his description of this Ashmere or Amir person, Robinson claims that the guy is known for cruising around Compton in a white stretch limo. Do you know what kind of car that uh, this Ashmere drives? White, white stretch limo. In fact, after saying that he thought the shooter escaped in a limo, the detective asked Robinson if he's just saying that because he knows this guy drives around in one. And Robinson admits that, yeah, he just made that up, that the guy escaped in a limo because the guy he's thinking of drives one. Now, think back, I want you to think back, Michael, if there's any specific car that anybody that you've talked to has told you that the guy got into, or are you just thinking that it might be a limo because you know that says Mir has a limo? Um, I'm thinking that it might be a limo because you have a limo. So... There was a well-known figure in Compton at this time named Stutterbox. And we know that Robinson had heard of Stutterbox because he mentions him in this interview twice. Stutterbox, but I told him yesterday. And? Well, I'm Stutterbox. And none of it matches the Amir Muhammad that Russell Poole went after. Poole took one of five names that Robinson listed completely ignored literally every other thing Robinson said in this interview about who this guy was and put the whole case on some random guy named Amir because he visited David Mack in prison. And Amir is a common name. If you Google it, you get 124 million results. There are probably millions of people named Amir. If years later, Robinson said, oh yeah, it was definitely a guy named Amir Muhammad after he's gotten out, and it's been in the media, then those statements are of no evidentiary value. 
because he didn't say it in this first interview. So this is why I get so annoyed when someone tries to tell me that this is the guy who did it. Because Russell Poole could have picked a name out of a hat and it would have the same credibility. And this guy, Amir Mohammed, has had to deal with this nonsense for nearly a quarter of a century. His name got published in the LA Times as a suspect based on this? Now I know that there are people who support Russell Poole who aren't going to like this. But I'm showing you the actual evidence that his theory is based on. So don't shoot the messenger. This is who he relied on. He participated in multiple books, at least two or three documentaries, multiple newspaper articles. Did he ever release Michael Robinson's taped interview like I am here? Did he even share this recording with the reporters and authors and filmmakers that he worked with? Or did everyone just take his word about what it said? So, if Michael Robinson was such a terrible informant in this case who who didn't really know any of the details, how did he get dragged back into this story? Well, first of all, Poole kept pushing this theory. As I said, he went to the press, he did books and film projects, and then Biggie's estate filed two wrongful death lawsuits, spaced apart by a couple of years, against the city of L.A. based on Poole's theory that David Mack had been part of Biggie's murder while he was an officer with the LAPD. And the first lawsuit ended in a mistrial in 2005, and the second one was dismissed in 2010. So now's a good time to remind you that Michael Robinson's street name was Psycho Mike. And as we said before, Robinson was a schizophrenic, by his own admission, since childhood. So Michael Robinson goes in to give a deposition for the Biggie Estates lawsuit, And according to the LA Times, he ends up admitting that his previous statement was based on hearsay and that he didn't know what the Samir person looked like. And when he'd been shown a photo six pack that included a photo of Amir Muhammad, where he'd circled half the photos, including Amir, he admitted that he had just guessed. And again, duh, he circled half the photos. He had a 50-50 chance of getting the guy. But the problem for Michael Robinson is that by now things have snowballed. He's in over his head. He told a dumb lie almost a decade earlier, and some people believed it, and now he's in the middle of a $400 million lawsuit against the city of Los Angeles. And all he can do is keep lying, so he claims he never said any other names other than Amir in the interview from 97, and that Detective Ball lied about it and said he said all these other names. So he's lying in this depot, and it's not going well. And in the middle of this deposition, Michael Robinson supposedly has a meltdown, flees the deposition, flees the building, and runs onto the nearby freeway into oncoming traffic. Robinson survived the freeway incident, but would die a actual evidence in front of you, and not other people's false representations about what Michael Robinson actually said. This story is kind of a B-side to the Michael Robinson story from the last episode, when I revealed the discredited source of Detective Russell Poole's theory that a suspect named Amir killed Biggie. Amir or Amir is a hair man. The story of an inmate named Waymond Anderson is tied to Michael Robinson's because they were in jail together at the time, and because Anderson would later claim that it was Michael Robinson's idea to concoct a story to sell to the Biggie homicide detectives, a scheme that Detective Russell Poole either fell for or exploited. Waymond Anderson first achieved notoriety as an R&B singer in the 80s named Suave. Uh, That's how he pronounced it. Signed to Capitol Records, and he had a minor hit with a cover of My Girl in 1988 which reached number 20 on the Billboard Hot 100, followed by another single called Shake Your Body, and a pair of albums called I'm Your Playmate and who hadn't been on the outside in over three years. By the time of Biggie's murder in March of 97, insert himself into the investigation. On April 2nd, 1997, the LAPD's Robbery Homicide Division took the Biggie case over from the Wilshire Division detectives who had been handling it for the first few weeks of the investigation. 
Just two days later, Wilshire Division forwarded a tip to the RHD detectives that an inmate named Wayman Anderson was claiming that he was personally approached by Suge Knight in jail to help kill Biggie Smalls. Now, despite the fact that it's completely ridiculous that Suge Knight would approach a random inmate facing life in prison to help them find weapons to commit a murder on the outside, especially a guy who hadn't breathed free air in over three years by this point, the RHD detectives still spring into action. It's a potential witness, and they have to investigate. So within minutes of receiving the tip, they request a polygraph of Anderson, and they send two detectives down to transfer him to Parker Center for a few days to interview him. The following day, Anderson is given the polygraph test, which he fails. As one detective interviewing him years later would put it, he failed miserably. So for Anderson, the failed polygraph is strike one. A couple days later, the two detectives who are working with Anderson at Parker Center, who have now conducted multiple interviews with him, report that they aren't sure he's being truthful. So like the polygraph machine, the detectives aren't really buying what Anderson is saying. That's strike two. And then Anderson's story gets a dagger through the heart. The basis for his story was that he and Suge Knight had briefly been held together at the inmate reception center while waiting for a court appearance. So according to Waymond Anderson, he and Suge are in this holding tank when Suge allegedly asks him for his help. And they were only together for about half an hour. So this is a very narrow window of time when this very improbable conversation could have happened. So one of the RHD detectives asks a deputy at the county jail to see if Anderson and Suge went to court on the same day. They're like, hey, uh, this might be a stupid question, but uh, is what he's saying even possible? And on April 16th, the deputy gets back to the detective and says that Anderson went to court on February 4th, 1997, but Suge didn't go to court until February 28th. That's 24 days apart. According to the deputy, there is no way that they could have been together. So within just 12 days of first hearing from Waymond Anderson, the RHD investigation is done with him. He's failed a polygraph, and now his claim about talking to Suge has been proven impossible. Five years later, in 2002, Waymond Anderson filed a personnel complaint against four LAPD officers, including Rafael Perez and David Mack. By this time, Poole's theory had been covered in the media for years. In fact, the report for this complaint by Anderson was dated December 20th, 2002, three months after Nick Broomfield's documentary Biggie and Tupac was released, starring Russell Poole and his theory, and pointing the finger at David Mack and Rafael Perez. And now Anderson suddenly remembers all kinds of crimes that he claims he witnessed David Mack and Rafael Perez committing a decade earlier. He even throws in an accusation that Perez had threatened him not to talk about Biggie's murder. Just like the claim that Suge had approached him about Biggie's murder in 1997, if there is a conspiracy theory, Anderson claims he was right in the middle of it, even if it doesn't make any sense. Anderson's personnel complaint against Mack and Perez and the two others goes nowhere, with all of his accusations being ruled as insufficient evidence or unfounded. But Anderson still wasn't done with this case yet. It's 2007, and the Biggie Estate has refiled their massive wrongful death lawsuit against the city of L.A., claiming that LAPD cops were involved in Biggie's murder. Two years earlier, Robinson had had his deposition meltdown where he fled the building and ran onto a busy freeway. But Anderson's deposition is conducted at Corcoran State Prison, where running out of the building and into traffic isn't really an option. So he does the next best thing. He denies everything he's previously said about Rafael Perez and David Mack. Just like Michael Robinson, Waymond Anderson recants. In this deposition, Anderson also claims that Michael Robinson was a paid informant for the FBI and the L.A. Sheriff's Department. And Anderson would claim that Robinson approached him because Robinson needed something new to give his FBI handler so he could keep getting paid. That he was supposed to bring them something once a month, but now he was in a jam because he was in jail. In other words, it's hard to be a street dope informant if you're no longer on the street. 
Going to jail had essentially hurt Michael Robinson's informant side business, and he needed something new. And Anderson claimed that it was Robinson's idea for him to contact the Biggie detectives. And if he gave information to the LAPD about the Biggie case, that Robinson would get credit for it and get his money. Now, it's very difficult to know when to trust what Anderson is saying. Anderson claimed in this 2007 deposition that at one point he was under what he referred to as a 90-day observation at what he called Patton, which is a state hospital in San Bernardino. The LA Times would report that he'd been sent there after experiencing a mental breakdown and that he'd been deemed mentally incompetent for a period. And Michael Robinson was a schizophrenic. So aren't these some interesting witnesses being used to support Poole's theory? So I don't know if the story about Robinson approaching Anderson in jail and the financial motive for him doing so is 100% true or 5% true. But we do know that Anderson and Robinson were housed together at the L.A. County Jail in Castaic. We know that because of this jail visitor log that shows them both housed in the same unit. And because Waymond Anderson confirmed it and even described Robinson as his neighbor. And we do know that Robinson was an informant for the FBI and the L.A. Sheriff's Department, just like Anderson claimed. And Robinson had admitted previously that he had been paid for information in the past. So have you, in the past, have you received compensation for various parts of your information? Well, in the past, yeah, I wasn't in custody. Stuff you were on the street, yes. and you supplied information in exchange for uh, money. You got any money, yes. Okay. So I think there's definitely at least an element of truth to Anderson's claims that it was Robinson's idea for him to meet with the detectives investigating Biggie's murder. And I believe it, because as we know from the last episode, just three months after Anderson swung and missed in 97, Robinson himself went to the Biggie detectives claiming he had information about Biggie's murder. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Waymond Anderson was dropping names like Keith Davis, a.k.a. Keefy D., and the Southside Crips. And then Robinson went and told detectives the killer was a Southside Crip named Kiki. Do you know what they used to call him <clears throat> when he was Southside? Might be Kenny or uh, Kiki, Kiki or something. Kiki or something like that. I don't know the guy. Kiki? Like Kiki, yeah. Kiki or something like that. Robinson was just repeating nonsense that he heard from people like Anderson. And then Russell Poole just conveniently ignored almost all of it in his race to accuse Amir Muhammad. It's not unusual for inmates to conspire to try to trick law enforcement into believing a made-up story. They agree on what it is they're going to say, and then they back each other up in their interviews with detectives to make the story seem credible, because the same story is coming from multiple sources. So how did Anderson end up associated with this case years later? if he was dismissed so quickly back in 1997. Well, like Robinson, Wayman Anderson found himself as a witness for the Biggie Estates lawsuit against the city of LA a decade later. And also like Michael Robinson, this would not go well. Anderson starts denying everything he said previously about cops being responsible for Biggie's murder. In this deposition, Anderson cleans up a lot of his previous statements and admits that he's been lying. But then he also launches into whole new wild claims. And the only time that I really believe him is when he's admitting that he's been lying. But here are some of the highlights. He claims that he and Robinson concocted a story in jail together and that it was Robinson's idea for Anderson to claim that he and Suge had met in person in the holding facility. And he says when he accused David Mack and Rafael Perez of committing crimes, that he'd used real crimes as examples, but then inserted their names into the stories. He also says that David Mack and Rafael Perez, quote, have nothing to do with this case. They had no involvement with the Biggie murder, none at all. And when they ask him if he has any information on Mack or Perez being involved in Biggie's murder, he responds, I have information about them not being involved in the Wallace murder. No LAPD officer was involved with the Wallace murder. It was a lie, and I'm ashamed of it. This deposition was posted to a blog back in 2008. So for the past 13 years, anybody could read this. One person who I know definitely read this depo was a reporter for the LA Times. Because a month after Anderson recanted in 2007, 
The LA Times ran an article with the headline, Inmate Recant Story About LAPD Link to Rapper's Slaying. This article notes that Anderson said he was offered a percentage of any settlement if he testified that former Los Angeles officer Rafael Perez had told him that another ex-officer, David Mack, was involved in the murder. For their part, the estate's attorneys denied making any kind of offer to Anderson, stating that his allegations were 100% demonstrably false. So even they had to say he was lying. Like I said, it's hard to know when Waymond Anderson is telling the truth. You know, I talked to him and, and uh, you know, I, I didn't think he was going to come, but he came. Surprised the shit out of me. He said Snoop kicked him out and he came to the hospital. Snoop never came to the hospital, you know? Because, number one, Warren did a thing where he was on the talking, whatever was shit they were doing out there, and he said that Snoop had a radio. He was at Snoop Hospital and shit. He walked out. I got a Rolls Royce, he got a Rolls Royce. He walked down the steps, I walked down the steps. We meet right here. I'm like, cuz, you going to Vegas? He do me like this. Mm. Went his way and he went my way. Next time I get a call, you know, niggas like, turn on the news, turn on the news, cuz. I'm at Warren G house. We turn on the news, we see yellow tape, Suge, BMW. Mm -hmm. Call Suge, he like, yeah, they whopped the come on out here now. Drive out there. Right after I heard Tupac got shot, I immediately flew to Vegas. Drive out there. I see him in the bed. Laid up. No words, no conversation. I see Jesse Jackson, his mama. I heard a horn. Bing, 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 honking in front of my house. Mm -hmm. I looked out the house and Snoop was outside in a uh, a white motherfucking Rolls Royce. Then he had this, the, the, the next tail back there. Remember the motherfucker? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> He had the motherfucker could go that whatever it was, it was hitting him all the way from what was going on from Vegas. Uh -huh. And then he started getting calls and shit, and they was telling him that Tupac got shot and da 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 da. This, that, this. Only way you have a radio, if you was at the fight with us and you had a security detail. I'm not having security detail. Tyson. What are you doing with the radio? Two, we always go to the fight together. We always go to the club together. Even when they did that half ass watered down movie on pot, and he said, you gonna be at the fight? And all that type of shit. <laughs> so then all of a sudden, Warren says on the stage where they listen to the radio and they hear the gunshots. And basically somebody told them, we got them or they got shot or all this shit. So how would you know that? Why would you have a play-by-play -play on the radio? I kicked everybody out. Get the fuck out of here, everybody. Get out of here, man. And he took off. That's when he went to Vegas mm -hmm. to go see him. And that's when he went out there and when he went to the hospital. But I, had, if I wouldn't have talked to him and, and, and got him to come over to my house, he probably would have been right there in the car with them. He said Snoop kicked him out. Then he came to the hospital. Snoop never came to the hospital, period. Then, Dash was on some other shit. I really hate bringing up Dash because I take mental health serious and I know he got mental problems, but Dash was on a situation saying that <clears throat> Snoop told him they can't go to the fight, can't go to the club, can't go to Vegas. It's going to fuck shit up because something will happen, basically. Were you in Vegas? No, we heard about it because they were trying to get us to go to Vegas. And we was like, Dog Pound, we was really on our fuck death row shit, really. You know what I'm saying? We was, already saying, we was already saying fuck death row. Um, Dad was like, no, I'm not going to that shit. You want to roll with them? If you're going, it's going to be all the bloods there, blah, 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 and none of the homies are going to be there. And I was like, dang, I didn't really think of it like that. I don't really feel uncomfortable, but now that you're saying like that, he's like, Snoop ain't going? Like, why would you want to roll? Why, we don't roll like that. You roll you roll with death row when the homies roll. And I was like, you right. So I ran back over there and I told Bach, like, Bach, I probably ain't going to be able to roll. I was like, that's one thing. Then Badass do an interview. And, you know, Pac being Pac, Pac was a real, real, real good motherfucker about getting everybody involved. 
So he seen badass, badass told the story. He said, Dad, what you doing? He said, well, they ain't putting me on that. He said, come on, I'll put you on the song. So he put badass on, snuck on, uh, on one of the songs that blew badass up. Now, I don't know Pac put him on the song. Pac said, man, I'm gonna let you, you, I'm, you can go to the fight with me. So Pac was like, um, I, you can go to the fight with me. I can fight, we going to the club. He said that, Dad told him, well, you can't go, something's gonna happen, basically the Pac or me, whoever. You go, it's gonna fuck shit up. He said that he was living with his mother and living with Dash, so he had to listen to Dash and not go to the fight. So I ran back over there and I told Pac, like, Pac, I probably ain't gonna be able to roll. And he was like, that's what's up? He was like, well, you know, well, I can't, like we said, we said our goodbyes and that was the last time I ever seen him or talked to him in life. Now, if all these people knew what was going on in the situation, nobody never commented to tell anybody that. So you're part of it. You're part of that snake, you know what happened to snake, snake, snake. So the other situation is that even after this shit, a motherfucker was with Keith E.D., according to Keith E.D. and everybody else, and everybody know this, street know this, I was locked up. But Snoop, Daz, and the rest of them, they did a song with one of the niggas from that from that side who was in the car. And that's little he's the pot. Shit. Motherfuckers don't need that type of melody. Who was it? And that's like the shit. Who they do the song with? What do you mean who was it? Who did the compilation? The person who did the compilation was that nigga Dre, or whatever his name is. Um, one of the last things Pac gave me <clears throat> was his medallion. Who's in Am Lambs? And it was cutting his shirt off to work on him. And Pac said, hold up, wait, wait. Simon, keep my chain for me. He was like, I got too many diamonds, you know how Pac is. He got, I got too many diamonds on his chain for letting one of these ambulances, one of these doctor people steal my chain. Keep it from me. And he said that, and I was on one bed, he was on the other, and we was going his way. I was like, you all right, homie? He was like, all right, homie, I love you. Call me on the leg. He goes, yeah, if anything happens, if anything comes up, Richie would be the one running the whole day in a day out operation. Man, I can't see it. Richie's dad told me that. Well, he goes, he said, Michael, if anything happens to Suge, that's what he told me. If anything happens to Suge, Richie would run the majority of the company. One thing Suge didn't do is he didn't blame any of it for Reggie. And trust me, the shit was already fault. Yeah, it was. It was already his fault. It should have been blamed on Reggie. You know, I mean, it wasn't even something where you could debate it. Any, any common sense tells you that the fault, just the fault was insured. You had been off for six weeks. Yeah. Every one of them decisions that got me out, of, me out of there, you in there, and everything else, all that came from Reggie's and he was screaming Machiavelli at the top of his lungs. That bodyguard that was pulled off his feelings pride. about what could go wrong. And Pac's words were, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut out Machiavelli, and when I cut out Machiavelli, I'm the hell up out of here. You got your money. I don't want nothing else to do with death row. I'm out. Right here in Las Vegas. And tonight we're hearing from two men who were on the front lines of the chaotic scene that night. They're speaking for the first time to the I-Team's Vanessa Murphy, who brings you this exclusive story. Steel set to bring them together. Here we go, round one. Scheduled for 12. Fight night in Las Vegas on September 7th, 1996. Bruce Mike Tyson versus Bruce Seldon. But violence erupted. A lot of chaos, a lot of cop cars. Just as we went, we started looking at each other to decide what we were doing, Metro told Man, they were waving us to come in. And then exiting their ambulance. Somebody met me at the back and said, go help my buddy. And, and my, buddy's, my buddy's shot in the car. So I... Right, which right. ended up being Suge Knight. whole car, it had, was riddled with bullet holes. Death Row Records co-founder Suge Knight was the driver of the BMW Shakur was gunned down in. We and brought the gurney brought up. Over. Just pulled them out. Mm -hmm. Pulled them out. Um, and that's when... You know, that's when I, everybody was yelling, um, Tupac, Tupac. And I leaned over to the cop and I'm, I, you know, I, I go, this guy has the same nickname as that rapper. Right.
And the cop, you know, looked at me and leaned over and was like, this is him. Then a second patient. We got word from PD um, that there was another guy that was shot in the head. Jim and I, I believe you, no, they, they walked him over to the ambulance. He got in and it was ended up being Shug Knight who was grazed on the head. He wanted us to make sure that we took care of Tupac right. before him. And then with three Metro police officers inside their ambulance and a police escort, not typical protocol, a ride to University Medical Center, followed by Jim telling Shane who their patient was. I listen to country music. I never heard of Tupac Shakur. So, so it, it didn't register to me. But soon after... Flashing police lights quickly replaced the bright lights of the Las Vegas Strip. News reports, vigils, and more help put it all into perspective. You were rooting for him? Some cases uh, at a standstill. We've learned some people who may have been witnesses or somehow connected to the murder are deceased. Badass said Nate Dog called California, called him Daz Snoop, and said Tupac and Sno Tupac and Sugar are dead. Suge just left in the ambulance and Pac left in the helicopter. Thursday night or Friday morning. And he asked me to go. Nate Dog went with him. Nate Dog was the first person who called me and Daz that track record and the first thing we heard was Suge Knight and Tupac are dead. That was the first thing we ever heard. And I was like, what the fuck? And we were just in awe. He was like, yeah, they just ambulance just came. They just airlifted Tupac out of here. Them niggas is dead. I was like, what the fuck? I was like, wow. wow. They just came. They just airlifted Tupac out of here. Them niggas is um. dead. One of the last things Pac gave me <clears throat> was his medallion, who's an ambulance, and it was cutting his shirt off to work on him. And Pac said, hold up, wait, wait, Simon, keep my chain for me. He was like, I got too many diamonds, you know how Pac is. He got, I got too many diamonds on his chain for letting one of these ambulances, one of these doctor people steal my chain. Keep it for me. And he said that. And I was on one bed, he was on the other, and we was going his way. I was like, you all right, homie? He was like, all right, homie, I love you. Call me on the leg. He goes, yeah, if anything happens, if anything comes up, Rishi would be the one running the whole day in the day out operation. Man, I can't see it. Rishi's dad told me that. Well, he goes, he said, Michael, if anything happens to Shug, that's what he told me. If anything happens to Shug, Rishi would run the majority of the company. One thing Shug didn't do is he didn't blame any of it for Reggie. And trust me, the shit was all Reggie's fault. Yeah, it was. It was all Reggie's fault. It should have been blamed on Reggie. You know, I mean, it wasn't even something where you could debate it. Any any common sense tells you that the fault, just the fault was yours. You had been off for six weeks. Yeah. Every one of them decisions that got me, and me out of there, you in there, and everything else, all that came from Reggie. Injury against him. And his son is talking about a green light on their side. A green light, prosecutors say, is an authorization to kill. And the feds are even providing resources to one witness so he could move. So how big of a gangster was Keefe D in all actuality? I talked to former Compton gang unit officer Bobby Ladd, author of Once Upon a Time in Compton, to find out. I have had many, many, many contacts with Keefe D. I say I grew up with him because I was only 23 years old when I started and he was a few years younger than me, but I started and I watched this guy grow up in the neighborhood. We used to chase him around in the Southside Crip area. I even arrested him at one time, you know? So it's like, I saw him become this uh, start, you know, just selling narcotics as a street little dealer. And I saw him become this huge narcotics dealer that he ended up selling narcotics all the way across the country. So um, I watched him become a shot caller within the Southside Crips gang. So. so tell me, how big of a drug dealer was Keefe D? Some people think that he has kind of bragged and uh, overstated his importance or his kind of level that he reached in that 
drug trade. I mean, was he a, as big of a drug dealer as he claims to be? He really was. He was the real deal. Um, the reason I know this, because Compton, like I say, was a small city and we worked the gang unit and we were inundated with shootings and murders. We didn't have the resources or the manpower to go after somebody that's selling uh, narcotics uh, across the country like Keefe D was. So during my time in the gang unit, I was hit up numerous times by uh, FBI task force and DEA task force that wanted to go after Keefe D. So they would tell me what he was doing. And so we would exchange information. We'd give him, uh, you know, all the people he's hanging around with and his associates. We'd exchange information. And they told us way back then that, hey, man, this guy's running uh, major kilos and PCP all the way across the United States. So he really was the real deal. Lad testified at the grand jury as a gang expert about life in Compton and what happened after Tupac was murdered. Now, the night Tupac was shot, um, my partner Tim and I, we were on our days off, and we get a call from our boss, Reggie Wright Sr., and he tells us about the shooting, and he goes, hey, man, I, we're here in the Southside Crips. That's the information I'm getting, and, and the war is coming back to Compton. So you guys just, just beware, get ready, because it's coming back. 